Greetings, friends and brothers. This is Dr. Bob Teal from Continuing Church of God. Today I'd like to go into the book of Exodus, starting with Exodus chapter 26. I'm going to talk about the tabernacle, sacrifices, and the priesthood, and some other things. Now this is the tenth part of a multi-part series that we're having on uh, the book of Exodus. We're trying to cover all the verses. And this is the last one I'm planning on doing uh, in 2019. I plan to finish it sometime in 2020. Anyway, if you've got your Bibles, you might want to follow along. We're going to start with Exodus 26. And predominantly, I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, essentially because that form of English is more understood by many, and it's intended to be a direct translation. Anyway, starting with verse 1. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen in blue, purple and scarlet thread, with artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain, four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to, to one another, and the five other curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain, on the uh, selvage of one set. And, and likewise, you shall do with the other outer edge, the other, other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops shall you make in one curtain, fifty loops shall you make in the edge of the curtain that's at the end of the second set, and the loops shall be clasped one to another. You shall have, make fifty clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with the clasp, so you'll make, they make one tabernacle. So we've got some instructions on how to make stuff. Now obviously we're not going around uh, making it there. It's interesting to note that the cherubim are supposed to be weaved into the curtains. But that isn't obviously to worship them, because we're not supposed to worship them, as you can see in uh, Revelation 19.10 uh, or uh, 22 verse 8. But apparently to show that the cherubim were associated with God's throne. So anyway, let's go back to, to verse uh, 7. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits, and eleven curtains shall have all the same measurements, and you shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent. You shall make fifty loops at the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set, and fifty loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. You shall make fifty brass bronze clasps, put the clasps in loops, and to couple the tent together that it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And on a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side, what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And yes, we're planning on going through all these things. I've got some pictures I'm going to show you as well here. And you shall make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. Now to verse 15. And for the tabernacle, you should make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of the board. A cubit and a half shall be the width of each board. Ten tenons will be on each board for binding one to another. Then you shall make all the boards of the tabernacle. And you shall make the boards of the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side. You shall make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards. Two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be 20 boards, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each side of the board. From the far side of the tabernacle westward, you should make six boards. You should also make two boards for two backs in the tabernacle. They should be coupled together at the bottom, and they should be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them. They shall be for the two corners, so it should be eight boards with their sockets of silver and two sockets on each side of the board. Now here is a picture of a version of this in, in Israel. This is a model that was that was made. Uh, it's uh, in the Timna Valley Park in Israel. This is a model of the tabernacle and I'll read a little bit more about it starting in verse 26. And you shall make Bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five for the boards on the other side of the tabernacles, and five bars for the boards inside the tabernacle, and the far side westward. The middle bars shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold, make their rings of gold as holders of the bars, and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown in the mountain. So you've got instructions. God says how, how, how to make this. 
And continuing in verse 31, you shall make a veil of woven blue and purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with artistic design of a caravan. You shall hang it down from the four pillars of the acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony in there behind the veil, and the veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. Now this was the veil that was torn in two uh, when Jesus died. So the veil was showing a separation. But we see that, again, when, Je when Jesus died, th this particular veil was torn in two. Anyway, continuing in verse 34, you shall put the mercy seat upon uh, the ark, the, the testimony of the Most Holy. And we showed you the mercy seat uh, last week, and I'll show it again here. I've got it there. So set, set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across the table from the side of the tabernacle toward the south. You should put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen door to the tabernacle woven of uh, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold and you should cast five sacks of bronze for them. The fact that there's a mercy seat is because God is merciful. And that's made clear throughout the Bible. You say, well, you're reading all this stuff about how to make this thing. And I realize we're not in the process of making it. But what's this part of the importance of this is telling us that God wants to tabernacle with human beings and that God is merciful. And the fact that God is merciful is not just because Jesus came, uh, and we read about that in the New Testament, but God had a plan for mercy throughout the whole time. And having a mercy seat, by the way, should help people understand what's going to happen in the white throne judgment. Now we're going to go to chapter 27. I plan on covering more chapters than uh, I usually do. I think the last sermon we just covered one chapter. Verse 1, chapter 27. We find that we're going to have directions in terms of making an altar of sacrifice. You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. And again, a cubit's about a foot and a half. Um, so around uh, half a meter. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. Just make its hor horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with bronze. Also, you shall make its pans to receive its ashes, and the shovels and its basins and its forks and its fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall make a grate for it, a network of bronze, and the network you shall make four bronze rings in its four corners. You should put it under the rim of the altar beneath, that the network may be midway up the altar. You should make poles to the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles you should put in rings, and the poles be on two sides of the altar to bear it. You should make, make it hollow with boards as it was shown to you in the mountain. So we're going to show you an artist's depiction of this, which is here. So you can get an idea of what it, it's talking about here. And you see the poles. And in verse 9 it says, You shall make uh, the court of the tabernacle. From the south side there should be hangings of the court made of uh, fine woven linen, 100 cubits long on one side, and 20 pillars and the 20 sockets shall be bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be silver. Likewise, along the length of the north side, there shall be hangings 100 cubits long, and its pillars and its 20 sockets of bronze, and the hooks and its pillars and the bands of silver. Now I'm going to interject something here. You know, for people who want to read the entire Bible through, it's when you start to get into this part where people start to say, huh? <laughs> uh, and they uh, sometimes, uh, maybe they stop. I know I did when I was a, a, a teen. When I got somewhere into this. I said, I don't understand it. What any of this could have to do with anything. And I didn't, uh, I just stopped. Now, obviously, God had instructions. He had instructions uh, for the physical people of Israel to make things. He wanted them to, to make things that represented what things were like in heaven as well as things to, to learn about him. And I didn't appreciate that when I was younger. Uh, have more appreciation for it now, but again, I realize that I'm 
not in the process of going out and making these things, but God gave the instructions so people could do it. Verse 12, along the width of the court on the west side would be hanging 50 cubits with their 10 pillars and 10 sockets. The width of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits. The hangings on one side, the gate shall be 15 cubits, and there are three pillars and there are three sockets. And all and on the other side shall be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and three sockets. So again, God is giving dimensions, so we know what it would look like. There's another picture of, of some of those things talking about here. At the gate of the court, there should be a screen 20 cubits long, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And it shall have four pillars and four sockets, and all the pillars around the court shall have the bands of silver. Their hooks shall be silver, their hooks shall be bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the width 50 throughout. And the height five cubits made of woven linen and its sockets of bronze. And all the utensils of the tabernacle for all its service, and all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. Now this court of the tabernacle, by the way, is also discussed in Exodus 38, uh, verses 9 through 20. Anyway, continuing here, Exodus 27, verse 20. And you shall command the children of Israel that they shall bring you pure oil of pressed olives for light to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. And the, uh, the care of the lampstand is also discussed in uh, Leviticus uh, 24, verses 1 through 4. As far as the lampstand, I've showed you this before. And this is a reconstruction of the menorah of the temple created by the Temple Institute. Uh, when I saw it, it was uh, in, in Jerusalem, and so I, I've actually seen this. And this again ties in with the seven candles uh, lampstands in the book of Revelation, uh, to read about chapter 1, for example, Revelation. And we talked about that in more depth in our previous sermon, which you can go back and watch if you haven't seen it, or rewatch if you have seen it. Okay, now to chapter 28. In chapter 28, we hear about uh, Aaron and his descendants to become priests of Israel. And this is uh, more information about, about that happening. So starting in verse 1. Now you shall take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons... Nadab, Elihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I fill with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that they may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons. They may minister as priest. As you can see the picture here, you see the ephod in yellow. I got this from, from Wikipedia. We also learn about special garments in uh, Exodus 39, 1 through 7. Anyway, it says, verse 5, they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet thread and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, and fine woven linen artistically worked. They shall have two solder straps uh, joined at its edges, so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship made of gold. Blue and purple and scarlet thread and fine linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names will be on one stone and six on the other stone, in the order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make a setting of gold, make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords, and fastened the braided chains to settings. So we see about purity here. We're talking about pure gold here. We're talking about pure olive oil before, as well as various precious things. People may not realize it, but uh, blue, purple, and things like that, they were really expensive to have these kind of colors uh, in the past. 
Anyway, continuing in verse 15. You should make the breast plate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod, you shall make it. A glue, uh, excuse me, of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen, you shall make it. And it shall be doubled into a square and a span shall be its length and a span shall be its width and you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of, rows, rows of stones. First row shall be sardis, a topaz, an emerald, and this shall be the first row. The second row shall be turquoise, sapphire, and a diamond. So we're talking about precious and semi-precious stones here. Third row, a janesis, janesis, an agate, an amethyst, and a fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. And these shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names. Like the engravings of the signet, each one with its own name, they shall be according to, their, to the twelve tribes. And this was supposed to be used in, uh, in judgment. Now let's continue in verse 22. With 22. You shall make chains of the breastplate on the end, like braided cords of pure gold. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate, and put two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold and two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the other braided chains, you shall fasten in two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in front. And yes, I know this is a lot of detail. God gives them how to do this. Verse 26. You shall make two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod. The other two rings of gold you shall make and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod toward the front, right under, at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. And I know this sounds like a lot of details. If you're the one actually trying to make it, <laughs> you need all these details. They shall bind the breastplate by means of his rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord so that it, that it, it is above the intricately woven bands of the ephod so the breastplate does not come loose in the ephod. So now we'll continue here, verse 29. We're going to learn more about this in a moment. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate judgment over his heart when he goes to the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. You shall put the breastplate of judgment in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and Thummim, that they shall be over Aaron's heart, where he goes in before when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall con shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. So I wanted to look into this a bit more, and you probably heard of the uh, Urim and Thummim. I'd like to read some of what the Catholic Encyclopedia, not the Catholic Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1906 talks about this. It says objects under says Erman Thuman, objects connected with the breastplate of the high priest and used as a kind of divine oracle. Since the days of the Alexandrian translators of the Old Testament, it's been asserted that this is referring to revelation and truth, or and or lights and perfections. That's what Erman and Thuman are supposed to mean here. Uh, it's called the breastplate of judgment. It's four square and double and twelve stones. We're not put inside the Hoshan, but on the outside. First uh, Samuel 28, 3-6 mentions three methods of divine communication. One, the dream oracle, which is frequently made mention also in Assyrian Babylonian literature. So they're saying, okay, one way God speaks to people directly is through dreams. And we have an article at the cogwriter.com website about dreams and continuing Church of God, and also at this channel, we have a sermon about dreams and continuing Church of God, so that you may want to watch. Anyway, number two, the oracle by the means of the Urim, undoubtedly an abbreviation for Urim and Thummim. And three, the oracle by the word of the prophets, found among the Semitic, all the Semitic nations. The only other mention of the actual consultation of Yahweh by the means of the Urim and Thummim found in the New Testament is in Numbers 27-21. Answer, yes or no. The Urim and Thummim are impl implied also wherever the earlier history of Israel mentioned of asking counsel of the Lord by means of the ephod. And they cite some other places like Joshua 9-14 uh, uh, and, and uh, Judges 1-2. Uh, one, one and uh, 20 verse uh, 18. 
And by the way, I've got an article uh, on this at the cgwriter.com website. If there's anything I go over too quickly, you want to go back here about it. It says basically the answer to the ephod is supposed to be yes or no. And in uh, rabbinical literature, this means it's not from the Bible. Rabbinical literature says tradition is unanimous in stating that the use of the Urim and Thummim ceased with the destruction of the first temple, or in other words, with the death of the older prophets. And uh, uh, Josephus states that this oracle had been silent for 200 years before his time, so maybe even ceased uh, prior to then. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 28. Verse 31. You should make the robe of the ephod all blue. There should be an opening for his head in the middle of it. And you should have a woven binding all around this opening. Like the opening of a coat of mail so it does not tear. Upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem. Bells of gold between them all around them. A golden bell and the pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers. And it should and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out, that he may not die. Now other priestly garments are described in Exodus uh, 39, verses 22 to 31. Anyway, back to Exodus 28, this time verse 36. I shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like an engraving of a signet. Holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord, and it should be on the turban, it should be in the front of the turban, it should be on Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel hollow in their holy gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. <clears throat> you shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread, and you shall make the turban of fine linen, you shall make a sash of woven work. Now to verse 40. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics, and you shall make sashes for them. You shall make hats for them for glory and beauty. So you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness, that they shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come to the tabernacle of meeting, when they come near the altar to minister to the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die. This will be a statute... Uh, forever to him and descendants after him. So we see that a certain amount of decency was required for the gar uh, garments of the priest. Now in Exodus 29, Moses is told how the priests are going to be consecrated and ordained when the time would come. So let's go to verse 1. And this is what you shall do to them. Hallow them for ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And you shall make them with wheat flour. And you shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and the bowl and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron, and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the, and the breastplate, and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on him. And you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and shall put their hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And you shall also concentrate Aaron and his sons. Now, consecration with oil is consistent with what the Christian church does regarding ordinations and anointing with oil. We have an article, the COG Writer dot com website on uh, the laying out of hands. We also have a sermon at the Continuing COG channel called Laying Out of Hands in Succession where we go into the uh, Christian aspect of that uh, in more depth. Now, we're going to go into uh, uh, verse 10 and beyond. And again, we're going through our intentions to cover the entire book of Exodus, which means we don't say, okay, well, this stuff is, taking, is too long, it's too boring, we're just not going to do it. So when we plan on covering the book of Exodus, we're planning on covering the book of Exodus. So let's go through this, now starting in verse 10, Exodus 29. You shall also have a bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands 
on the head of the bull. You should kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Just take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe that's attached to the liver, the two kidneys and the fat that's on them, and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull with its skin and its offal you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It's a sin offering. And we've read the scriptures from the book of Hebrews in prior sermons on this series explaining why we don't need to do that anymore. Anyway, verse 15. Before we get to verse 15, let me realize bull was expensive. And even the next one, you take one ram for uh, for an individual family. That was a costly item. Anyway, you take one ram, Aaron and his sons, and put their head on the hands on the head of the ram. You shall kill the ram. You shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around the altar. You shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces with its head. You shall burn the whole ram with, on the altar. It's a burnt offering to the Lord. It's a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall also take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram. You shall kill the ram, take some of its blood, and pour it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot, and sprinkle the blood all around the altar. You should take some of the blood that's on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and on the garments of his sons that he and his garments shall be hallowed his, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. They were supposed to be priests and they're supposed to uh, be holy before God when they perform the priestly uh, duties. Verse 22. You should take the fat of the ram, the fat tail, and the fat that covers the entrails, and the fatty lobes attached to the liver, the two kidneys, and the fat on them, and the right thigh, for it's a ram of consecration. One loaf of bread, one cake made with oil, one wafer from basket of unleavened bread that's before the Lord, and you shall put all these in the hand of Aaron and his, and of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back from their hands and burn them as, on the altar as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma for the Lord, is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Verse 26. Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration, and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. In the ram of the consecration, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering which is waved, and the thigh of the wave offering which is raised, of which of that which is for Aaron and that which is for his sons, and you shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and his sons as a statute forever. So heave offering, it shall be a heave offering for the children of Israel from the sacrifice of the peace offering for the heave offering to the Lord. So anyway, they had different offerings for different purposes. Now continuing, verse 29, And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him. So his Aaron's holy clothes were going to go to whoever repla replaced him. And to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. The son who becomes priest in his place shall place Put them on seven days when he enters the tabernacle of the meeting to minister in the holy place. And he shall take the ram of consecration and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that's in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. And the fact that they were boiling the flesh would mean, of course, they would destroy any bacteria or anything that could be in it. They shall eat of those things which the atonement was made to consecrate and sanctify them, but an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh, the consecration offering of the bread remains until the morning, you shall burn the remainder with fire, it shall not be eaten because it's holy. Then you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all I command you. Seven days you shall consecrate them, then you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you'll make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it. So here seven coming through. You know, God uses the term seven for completion. Uh, the seven-day week. Uh, Sabbath the seventh day of the week. Uh, seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, seven days of unleavened bread. Anyway, and the altar shall be most holy. Whoever touches, whatever touches that altar must be holy. Now I want to read something from the old uh, radio church of God about what I've just went through. This is from uh, the Good News Magazine, September 1965 by the late uh, Dr. Ernest Martin. All of these physical rituals foreshadowed in a variety of ways the coming of Christ, his sinless life and his atoning power, his resurrection and glorification. They prefigured the working of the Holy Spirit, which showed in symbolism many other important spiritual principles. Truly, these physical rituals were all very important in 
for the Old Testament church, the congregation of Israel. They did reveal the workings of Christ and His Holy Spirit which were to come. However, the physical rituals lost their importance and were not needed when the realities came which, were, which they portrayed. The true Christian today does not need the physical and ritualistic relationship with God and the carnally, that the carnally minded Israelites of old were required. We should worship God in spirit and truth, John 4, 24. We seek to obey His commands and His laws without the imposition of physical rituals and sacrifices. Now we're going to go to, back to uh, Exodus uh, 29. We're going to see information about daily offerings, starting verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other lamb shall offer at twilight. With one lamb shall be one-tenth an epoth of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer it with the grain offering, with a drink offering in the morning for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Going down to verse 42. This shall be a continual bird offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Well, it seems like because people would have been sinning daily, this is probably why we had God had these offerings uh, daily, these sin offerings, daily offerings here. Anyway, going back to verse 44, now to verse 44. So I'll consecrate the tabernacle of the meeting and altar. I'll also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord or eternal their God or Yahweh their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them for I am the Lord their God. Now God is stating here that he set up his religious government of ministers so that his people would know that he's God. And we have an article at the cogwriter.com website about church governance. It's called The Bible, Peter, Paul, John, Polycarp, Herbert W. Armstrong, Roger C. Meredith, and Bob Teal in church government. And we also have a sermon at the Continuing COG channel that you can watch. Now we're going to go into Exodus chapter 30. And here we're going to see that the Moses was told to make an altar of incense to be placed near the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. This is also described in Exodus 37, verses 25 to 24. You shall make an altar of burn incense to burn incense on. And here is a picture of it. You shall make an altar of a, you should make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, a cubit shall be its width, and it shall be square. Two cubits shall be its height. Its horns, you see the horns there, shall be one piece with it. You shall overlay it with its top, its sides all around. Its horns of pure gold, and you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. The two gold rings you shall make for it in a molding on both of its sides. You shall place them on its two sides. And by the way, so that's instruction is where they came up with how to do this. And they shall be holders of the poles which shall bear it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay it with gold. You shall put it before the veil, which is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat. That's the testimony where I'll meet you. And I've seen... Uh, physical representation of this. Uh, uh, so my wife has two, and some other people in church I think have seen versions of it. This particular one was from Israel, and I didn't see the one in Israel. And going down now to uh, verse 7. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he t tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it as a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it. So you've got to do it God's way. We need to leave our lives God's way. We need to pray God's way. And we have a, a booklet on that. I wasn't going to bring that one up, but this is a good time to do it, I think. Prayer, What does the Bible Teach? This is available at the ccog.org website. I'll click on the literature tab and you can find this. And we should do things God's way. And incense uh, is related to prayer. We'll get to that uh, in a sense. But by the way, anyway, the Bible indicates the incense is of the saints is uh, the prayer of the saints is like incense before God. That's what I meant to say. Okay. Verse ten: Aaron shall make atonement uh, upon its horn once a year. 
with the blood of the sin offering at atonement. Once a year you should make atonement upon it throughout your generations, most holy is the Lord. And this is a, a, a burning incense, it's symbolic of the mediation of uh, Jesus on our behalf as well. But uh, the atonement uh, is something that uh, we in the Church of God continue to keep. Uh, it's one of God's, God's holy days. We don't keep it the way the Jews did, ceremonially. But uh, for information on this book, it's also available at the ccg.org website. And so let's go to the book of Hebrews. Go to the uh, New Testament. I was debating if we should do that, but I think this is a good thing to do here. To read about some of these things. We read that the animal blood is no longer re required, and we, and we don't need a human priest to do it. You know, I've been reading all these things, but in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 6, it says, Now when these things had th thus prepared, the priests always went to the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But in the second part, the high priest went in alone, once a year, we just read that, in Exodus here, verse, verse 10. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. And the Holy Spirit indicating this, that by the way the holiest of all was not yet made manifest when the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerning only foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. And I read about drink offerings and food offerings, etc. Verse 11, But Christ came as high priest, the good things to come, but the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not of the creation, not like the one I was showing you before, not with the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls, which I read about, and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies it for the purification of the place, flesh, or the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And as I mentioned, Christians today, we keep uh, the Day of Atonement uh, what was the understanding of Christ's role in it? Now, let's go back to Exodus 30, verse 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, there should be that there be no plague among them when you number them. And this is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is twenty geras, a garaz. A half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Everyone included among those who are numbered from twenty years old shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When you make an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves, you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, that it shall be it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Now, a gera was a bean. And the weight of 20 of them apparently was about 220 grains. So half of that seems to be about 0.22 troy ounces. So some have said maybe as much as a, a half a troy ounce. So that's what they're talking about. Anyway, what this shows is that you can't buy atonement. And sometimes I have uh, referred to the scripture in the atonement offertory. Well, anyway... Let's go back to Exodus 30, this time in verse 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, And it, you shall make a lever of bronze, and its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. You shall put water on it, for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet and water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and, and their feet lest they die. This will be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. So we see that the priests were supposed to be ceremonially clean. Now Christians should be spiritually clean. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 25. Ho! 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Okay, so we see the cleansing, washing of water by the word, as opposed to the other kind of cleansing that they were doing here in uh, Exodus 30. That he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. Now, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to read something here, starting verse 15. You've got people these days who want to combine non-biblical things with biblical things, and they think that this is what, what God is pleased with. They think it's okay to mix those kinds of things together. This is the back cover of our book, which should you keep God's holy days or demonic holidays, showing you some of the demonic symbols that people have incorporated in what their version of the Christianity is. Anyway, in 2 Corinthians 6, starting verse 15, we read, And what accord has Christ with Belial, or the devil? And what part is the believer and the unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them, I will walk with them, I will be their people, they shall be my... I shall, I shall be their God, they shall be my people. Verse 17. Therefore, do things their way. No, therefore, come from, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Before I go any further, I got an email from somebody who was once part of the old uh, Worldwide Church of God uh, about four decades ago. I guess they left four decades ago. And they seem to think it's perfectly fine to combine with uh, those who do the unclean. Uh, and I told them I did not agree. Uh, anyway, we're supposed to be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what's unclean, and, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we see certain things about ceremonial uh, cleanliness in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we're supposed to be spiritually clean. You don't have to go there, but James 4, verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 1, starting verse 8. First John 1 John 1.8 If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in, him, in us. This is why we need to be cleansed. We need to confess our sins before God and God will forgive them, but not if we hold on to them. When you wash, you try not to hold on to filth or, or, or dirt or, you know, let's say filth. And we're supposed to be washed, cleansed, washed and clean, cleansed by the blood of Christ. And we ask forgiveness to be cleansed. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 30, and this time verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourselves quality spices. Interesting, he says quality spices. God said uh, the good stuff. Moreover, uh, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much as sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of cassia, according to this shekel is sanctuary, and a hint of olive oil. And you shall make from them a holy anointing oil, and anointment compound according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tabernacle of the meeting and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all its utensils. The lampstand of the meeting and the ark of the testimony, the, t excuse me, the lampstand and its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver in its base. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister me as priests. Verse 31. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on 
men's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it, according to the composition. So I just read all this stuff, and God is saying, don't go out and mix this all together yourself. But I know some people have done so. Not necessarily, not in the church, but I think some Protestants have done this. It's holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whatever compo Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts it, any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. Now, throughout history, uh, olive oil has been used for anointing and ordinations, but it appears to have been pure olive oil as opposed to the particular spices which were used for the Levitical priesthood. Anyways, in Exodus 30, now in verse 34, and the Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stacti, and onicha, and gabanum, and pure frankincense, there's one I've heard of, or no. And put these sweet spices, and there shall be an equal amount of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted and pure and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine, and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle meeting where I meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord, whoever makes any like it, to, to smell it, he should be cut off from his people. Now I mentioned uh, incense and saints. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And while you're turning now, I'm just going to comment that, again, with his incense, you weren't supposed to make it, just like the holy anointing oil you were supposed to make. So God had these instructions. Anyway, Revelation 5, verse 8. Now when you take in the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This is one of the reasons why I mentioned before we have a, a free book, Prayer, What Does the Bible Teach? Now if you want to go over to Revelation chapter 8, starting verse 1, we'll read a few verses there as well. When you open the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. So we see that God has a future intended use for incense, but we also see in Revelation 5.8 that... Uh, the bowls are filled with the golden incense, which is the prayers of the saints. So yes, your, your prayers can be actually held in these golden bowls. So try to, to not neglect prayer. Try to pray. Anyway, let's go back to Exodus 31, 30, actually 31 now, because we just finished Exodus 30. And in here uh, we find out that God tells uh, Moses he's chosen certain ones to build the tabernacle with his furnishings. So in verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, spoke to Moses, saying, See, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for settings, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. So notice that God gave special talents to get the job done. I'm going to go to the book of Philippians, so if you want to go over there, uh, Philippians chapter 1. God doesn't give us tasks that we can't do. Sometimes it may seem that way, and often <laughs> perhaps it seems that way. And we may get frustrated or lose our patience or whatever. I mean, Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul wrote, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God had a plan for the children of Israel to build all this stuff, but he gave a way to do it. They probably thought, how am I supposed to do this? And in Philippians 4 verse 13, pretty short, I'll give you a moment to get over there though. The Apostle Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so can you. That's not limited to the Apostle Paul. 
Now let's go to the sixth verse of Exodus 31. And indeed, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And I put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tabernacle of the meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle. And the, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and the base, the garments of the ministry, the holy garments of Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense, incense in the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you. So you see, there were others that God provided wisdom, other skills needed for that project in the New Testament. Now let's go to the Old Testament, the book of James. God gave these people wisdom to do their job. This would be James 1. We're going to read starting verse 5. And God promises wisdom to those who ask for it in the New Testament. James 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach. And it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord, for he's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Now consider that the artisans in Exodus 31 here, these are God's workmen. And Christians are God's workmen now. I'm going to go to Ephesians 2, verse 10. You don't have to go there, because I'm only going to read one verse, but... Ephesians 2.10 says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And you know, we know that much was written for the children of Israel for our examples, according to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 11. So you see this, you read this and say, okay, so God gave these people wisdom. Well, God can give you wisdom. Written for our example. Now, as far as the uh, artisans go, by the way, I mentioned this guy by the name of uh, 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 Hissamach. And he was the father of one of the craftsmen who would build the tabernacle, which you can read about in Exodus 35.4. He's actually mentioned in ancient uh, archaeological records that uh, Dr. Doug uh, Petrovich reported about. He found that name in the ancient, uh, uh, some ancient artifact. And one of the reasons I'm bringing that out is that a lot of people try to say there's no evidence of uh, the Exodus or a bunch of these other things. And there actually is evidence, but there are many who don't want to accept the evidence or believe it. Now, let's go back to Exodus 31, starting in verse 12. We're going to, this time we're going to talk a little bit about the Sabbath. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. For it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it's holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall be truly put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. The seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now God intended for the Sabbath to be kept and the penalty for violating was severe. Now, the fact that uh, you'd be put to death for it should help tell us that we should not be afraid so afraid to lose our jobs or our situation in school that we would violate the Sabbath commandment. Now, as far as it being a sign, decades ago there's an elder that uh, my wife and I knew in the old uh, Worldwide Church of God. At the time he was in Long Beach. And he would uh, mention that you can remember Exodus 31 was a sign for the Sabbath based on a sign of, or a logo of an ice cream company called uh, Baskin Robbins. Their old logo had 31 on it. It represented the fact they used to always try to have 31 flavors of ice cream at their uh, uh, stores. 
They would come up, I think, with a flavor every month or so, and they would drop one and they keep changing it. They always kept vanilla and chocolate and whatever. But uh, anyway, their old logo used to have a, a 31 on it for the 31 flavors of, of uh, ice cream. So anyway, I looked at their new logo and it doesn't, doesn't have 31 on it. But their, the comments from that elder always helped me remember that, yeah, the Sabbath is a sign. You can read about it in Exodus 31. So that's just a memory technique, if you will, at least uh, for me. Now I go to the last verse of uh, Exodus 31, verse 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. In Exodus uh, 24, verse 12, shows that uh, God wrote the Ten Commandments with this, his, his finger on tablets of stone. So we're presuming this is what uh, this seems like, obviously seems connected to this here. Because God wrote it with his finger and we see this here. Now, sadly, in, verse, in chapter 32, we find that even before Moses returned to camp to notify the workmen, the people rose up in rebellion against uh, uh, God really uh, and uh, Aaron made a golden calf so let's go down here to Exodus uh, 32 starting verse 1 now when the people saw that Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him come make us gods that shall go before us for as for this Moses the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt we don't know what's become of him so these people were not patient they didn't want to wait to do things God's way. And people today are impatient. I've had, I remember some people who originally received our letters to the brethren because we didn't have a congregation in their area. And I suggested that they do that until we might get one. Well, several, some of them uh, will drop out after a while, ask to be taken off because we don't have a congregation there. Um, they're, they're blaming the, the church or God for that not being there, but obviously they weren't ready, they weren't willing to endure to the end, uh, etc. So when when people read things in Exodus, they're too, oh, it never happened to me. Actually, we still see these kind of things happening to people these days. Anyway, now to verse uh, 32. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So the people brought off, broke off the golden earrings which were on their ears uh, and brought them to Aaron and he received the gold in their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is the feast of the Lord and they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. People sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. Obviously, Aaron shouldn't have been involved with this but apparently he feared the people and he sinned and he enabled some of their sins. Anyway, God is not pleased with any of this as you already know or could imagine. Go down to verse uh, 7 of Exodus 32. And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down, for your people have, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And he turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Indeed, it's a stiff-necked people. Therefore, Now therefore... Let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll make of you a great nation. Now this is horrible. God wanted to destroy all of them and start all over with Moses. Now here was Moses' chance for a less stressful life in a dynasty, because he had to deal with all these people. But he turned it down. Verse 11, Exodus 32. He didn't just turn it down. It says, And the Lord pleaded with the Lord as God. His, Moses pleaded with the Lord as God and said, Lord, why is your wrath burned hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He's brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, 
to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land and I have spoken of, I will give to your descendants that they may inherit it forever. Well, after Moses' pleading, God decided not to destroy the Israelites. Verse 14. So the Lord relented from the harm which he had said he'd do to his people. God can hear your prayers and your pleadings as well. Now let's go to verse 15 of Exodus 32. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So then Moses comes down, starts to come down the mountain, and he sees Joshua, verse 17. And Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, and he said to Moses, There is noise of war in the camp. But he said, this, this would be Moses, It's not this noise of shout of victory, nor the noise of cry of defeat, but the voice of singing I hear. So the Israelites are having some kind of a party, like the pagan idolaters in the land area, the area they were in. Now let's go down to verse 19. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the camp calf and dancing. So Moses could see this. So Moses' anger became hot. And we read throughout uh, the, Moses' writings that he got angry at times. And this one, he got really mad. He got so mad, he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. They shouldn't have broke what God made, but he did. He was so angry. Verse 20, Then he took the calf which they had made, and he burned it in the fire, ground it in powder, scattered it in water, and made the children of Israel drink it. So they lost their wealth, they lost their idol. Anyway, Moses was not pleased. In verse 21, Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you brought so great a sin upon them? So Moses is putting some blame, a lot of blame here on Aaron. And I think, and Aaron obviously should have stood up and not to them and not done this. Verse twenty-two. So Aaron said, "Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil, for they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has gold, let him break it off. So." They gave me, gave it to me, I cast it in the fire, and this calf came out. Adam blamed the people. Kind of reminds me of you know, Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve blamed the, uh, the serpent, and Adam blamed Eve. He says, you know, God, the woman you made, she's the one that did this. Anyway, Aaron seems like he's following his suit. So he blamed the people. And he tried to imply he was less involved in the process than it seems like he was. Anyway, in verse 25, And Moses saw the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to the shame of their enemies. The implication with this and the following verses is Aaron and Levites were not full and willing participants in all that happened. But again, uh, Aaron should have stood up. Anyway, continuing verse 26, Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put on his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother and every man his companion, every man his neighbor. Uh, idolatry was a capital crime, but God didn't have everyone killed. But, but notice how many. Verse 28. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So there's a massive cost of life for this sin. Now continuing, verse 29. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. And that's partly why the Levites became the priestly tribe. Anyway, continuing in chapter 32, now we're going to pick this up in verse 30. Moses was still very concerned. It came to pass the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. 
So Moses was very concerned about this. Anyway, continuing, verse 31. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will, will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you've written. Huh? This book is a reference to the book of life. Now, Moses knew it was reference to the book of life. It also appears in this passage that uh, God is speaking about a book of uh, about a book and a day of punishment, by the way. Anyway, this same book is actually mentioned in Psalm uh, uh, 69, uh, verses 27 and 28, where both uh, the concepts are discussed. Now I'm going to read this from the NIV. Not because it's always a greater translation, but I think for this one it be a little clearer. It says, Charge them crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not listed with the righteous. And it seems like the book of life is written in other psalms. For example, we're going to go to Psalm uh, 40. So you may want to go there. And verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book that is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your laws within my heart. So those who are written in the book delight to do God's will and His law is written in their heart. Now let's go to Psalm 56, verse 8. Your number, my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? So it's indicating that the tears are there. Well, we found that you know, the prayers are in the golden bowls. We see about tears as well. And we see about the book. Now let's go to Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So God knows the end from the beginning. Now let's go to Malachi 3.16 to learn something here. Give me a moment to get there. Then those who feared the Eternal, or Yahweh, spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. So we see that those who fear God are mentioned in the book, and those who are not righteous are not. Now Christians who are ascribed in the book of life are going to be born again at the resurrection, which occurs the seventh trumpet uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation. And we also have a sermon at the Continuing Seed with You channel called Trumpets and Being Born Again. Now, does the New Testament teach whose names are written in the book of life? Well, yes, it does. Let's go to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 10. And from there, we're going to start with verse 18. And he, this is Jesus, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So true followers of Jesus have their names listed somewhere in heaven. And that somewhere is a book of life. So I'm going to go to Philippians 4, verse 3. Now, some might say, well, he was talking to the uh, disciples at the time, the apostles and disciples, but it's not just them. Philippians 4, verse 3, the apostle Paul writes, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. Okay, so we've got women specifically mentioned here. I want to mention this. People think that only men's names are listed in the book of life. With Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. But you have come to Mount Zion, in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly 
and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Okay, so we've learn about this registered here. This didn't use the word book, but still talking about the book of life. We can also see this in Revelation 3, verse 5, where John recorded something that Jesus taught. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his, before his angels. So the saints, the true Christians, are those who are written in the book of life. And the saints are those who are going to be resurrected at the last trumpet. First trumpet. Yeah, the last trumpet, the first resurrection. I didn't confuse myself on that. Now there's other passages in the book of Revelation that mention those who worship the beast, those who are involved with his abominations, various abominations, and those who take away from the book of Revelation will not be among those whose names are written in the book of life. So we hear about the book of life again in Exodus 32. Let's go back to Exodus 32 to, to read something else. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore, go lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels will go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit, visit punishment upon them for their sins. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the, with the calf was Aaron had made. So punishment wasn't over, with just the 3,000 dying. Now notice, though, only God can remove someone from the book of life, and idolaters are going to be punished. Now, with what's going to come ahead uh, with the, the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord, don't think that your spouse or your minister can save you either. Now, you might note, well, Moses pleaded with God and, destruct, and stopped the destruction of the children of Israel. And you'll likely remember that you know, God used Noah not only to save himself, but his family. But all his family uh, were not righteous, as you can see in Genesis 9, 22 to 24, which we're not going to go. But I do want to go to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, chapter uh, 14, starting verse 12. See this prophecy. Give me a moment to get there. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when a man sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread and send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to come to their land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through it because of the beast, even though these three men were in it as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither their sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered, be delivered and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on the land, and that's going to happen to, for example, the land of the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and uh, the United Kingdom, and I cut off man and beast from it, even as these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither their sons nor daughters, but only, the, only they themselves would be desired. Now verse 19. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out fury on it in blood. You read about pestilences. Uh, Jesus talked about them. You also read about them in Revelation chapter 6, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Fourth horse. And cut off it from it man and beast, even though Noah... Daniel and Job were in it. As I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would only deliver themselves by righteousness. So I've gone through God's instructions regarding the uh, construction of the tabernacle and the altar and various things associated with sacrifices. But we see that the children of Israel were not patient and they were unfaithful. Don't follow the example of the children of Israel who complained don't follow the example of those of uh, Israel who are not patient, would not wait on God or his, his servants to do certain things. Pursue righteousness. That's part of what we learn from uh, Exodus 26 to 32. We also learn that these things were for our examples and that 
we go to the book of Hebrews, again, we don't have to do this, these same sacrifices, but they were to teach us lessons. And hopefully you've been learning the lessons from the book of Exodus that are also discussed in the New Testament and the rest of the Bible. This is Dr. Bob Teal, the Continuing Church of God.